Thank you. I would like to call the regular meeting of September 26, 2022 to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Will the secretary please call roll? Commissioner Alderetti? Here. Commissioner McLaughlin? Here. Commissioner Morrissey? Here. Commissioner Ramos? Here. Commissioner Wu? Here. Vice Chair Calderon? Present. Chair Pham? Here. Chair Quorum has been reached at 5.40 p.m. Thank you. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to make a notice announcement that item number one, Item number two and item number four will be continued. Um, item number one for the Gary Avenue project will be continued to October 10th. Item number two for the cell tower will be continued to November 14th. And item number, item number four regarding the zoning ordinance will be um, continued to uh, a future date and a, um, a notice will be issued. You are for item one and two, since we have a date that is determined, uh, if you are here to speak on those uh, items, you're more than uh, welcome to speak uh, at that time. As for item number four, because we do not have a date, a certain date yet, um, you're more than welcome to speak during the general comments, but public uh, comments for that specific item will be uh, deferred uh, till the, a date is uh, determined. Okay, before we begin, I'd like to remind my fellow commissioners to turn your microphones on when speaking and off when not speaking. And when speaking, please place a microphone about four inch away from you. Members of the public may attend planning commission meetings in person or virtually via Zoom. I now invite the commission secretary to describe the way the public can access and participate in this meeting. This meeting is being live streamed via our portal, www.santa-anna.primegov.com slash public slash portal into YouTube, www.youtube.com slash city of Santa Ana videos. If you would like to provide a public comment, you may do so in the following ways. Join the meeting via Zoom. Enter meeting ID 891-913-9760. When the item you would like to comment on is being discussed, select the hand icon to let us know you would like to speak. You will be called upon by the name you entered. You can also join the meeting by calling 669-900-6833. Enter meeting ID 891-913-97602. When the item you would like to comment on is being discussed, press star nine to let us know you would like to speak. You will be called upon by the last three digits of your phone number. After you are called upon, you may press star six to unmute yourself. For those who are attending this meeting in person and would like to provide public comment, please fill out a request to speak form and turn it into the secretary. All speakers will have three minutes to speak. I will alert you when your time is up. Thank you. Moving on to public comments on non-agenda items. Um, Madam Secretary, does anyone wish to speak? If you are attending this meeting in person and would like to comment on non-agenda items, please fill out a request to speak form and turn it into the secretary. If you are participating via Zoom and would like to comment on non-agenda items, please select the hand icon and unmute yourself. If you are calling in and would like to comment on non-agenda items, please dial star nine and then star six to unmute yourself. I will wait a few seconds. Chair, we have one speaker for non-agenda items. Uh, okay. Wesley Menke, 1032 West Park Lane um, on item number four. So that's not happening tonight. So that means if anyone that came here to speak on short-term rentals, they would need to speak now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so they, do they need to fill out a new paper if their previous paper said they were here for item number four? Well, again, 
the item has been moved to a different date. Um, no decision will be made. Um, I just so if, I, I would suggest if it's something that that it's pertinent to the decision making of that item, I would reserve uh, that till that date. I think that would be a bit more um, uh, helpful to the discussion at that time. You don't but want if any you still of these... wish if you still wish to speak. Um, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I would like to, and I think a lot of people came here to speak to it tonight, and so. If you want to speak, you're going to have to fill out a new paper. Otherwise, they're not going to let you speak on item number four, short-term rentals. Um, it's been indicated that uh, the city's going to pass an ordinance, revise the ordinance to uh, prohibit them. Currently, it relies on a uh, interpretation known as passive, um, or excuse me, permissive ordinance. And um, I would encourage you all to vote no on passing a, a revision that would explicitly state prohibition. I think that's really the wrong way to go. Um, you're going to have a lot of people doing it under the radar. It's not going to help. We got to regulate it and you got to tax it. By doing that, you're going to pr preserve housing. You're going to bring it above board. You're going to get a lot of revenue for the city. So please vote no on um, a prohibition. Uh, send it back. And we'd be happy to work. There's a lot of people here that'd be happy to work um, with the with the good workers here of the city to put together a proposal uh, that would regulate it and have it be appropriate to the city. You know, a certain percentage of homes, um, but a blanket prohibition um, is not in keeping with uh, the city, the spirit of the city. Um, we're coming up to Las Posadas. Um, which I have participated in the city on multiple occasions. And when you do a La Posada, you go to someone's house and you knock on the door and you say in Spanish, you know, you reenact um, hospitality. And there's a back and forth. I feel like this is a city that really embodies hospitality. I think people all over the world want to come here. They don't just want to stay in big corporate hotels. They want to stay in local communities that supports uh, people to pay their mortgage, that supports and it can be regulated to really care for the communities. So um, yeah, please please uh, uh, meet with, with these hardworking business entrepreneurs and uh, together we can really care for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, refrain from uh, clapping. Caller with numbers ending in 907, please unmute and provide your comment. Hello, my name is, <clears throat> hi, my name is Nancy Hanna. I am a uh, housing advocate and I work with Better Neighbors LA and I'm also speaking on behalf of uh, Unite Here Local 11 that represents thousands of restaurant and hotel workers um, in Santa Ana. Um, and I, uh, I know the items have been moved, but I do want to make a comment because I do agree with the last comment that um, the city of Santa Ana can expect to um, see a lot of people operating short-term rentals in violation of a prohibition. And that is exactly why it is so important for the city of Ana to ensure that it has appropriate um, enforcement mechanisms to enforce its ban. Um, the Better Neighbors LA would support a ban in Santa Ana to protect local industry, to protect housing um, for the workers of Local 11. Um, and we have seen over and over that as short-term rentals take over uh, communities, we see housing being dedicated to short-term rentals. We see rental prices going up. We see fewer and fewer apartments being available. Um, because so many people would prefer to rent to someone on a temporary basis instead of um, allowing the residents and, and workers of Santa Ana to stay on a long-term basis. So um, I would like to submit my comment in support of the ban. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, David Suarez.
thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to comment. Uh, my name is David Suarez, and um, my wife Martha and I purchased our home in the uh, Morrison Park neighborhood in 2018. We did so because we love the architecture in Santa Ana. Um, the home already had a uh, great guest suite, which was perfect for our visiting relatives from out of state and uh, also to use it as a short-term rental. The income we make from it pays, as the one uh, commenter mentioned, for our property taxes and the small mortgage we have. We're retired now and would not be able to properly maintain our 70-year-old home, at least not to our liking, uh, in, uh, if we did not have that income. In 2019, we started hosting travelers. They come from all over the, the, the United States, as well as Canada, Europe, and, and Australia. Over 80% of those people visiting us, staying at our home, are going to Disney or the Anaheim Convention Center. There are only four Santa Ana hotels within a three mile radius of our home. As you know, Morrison Park is on the north end of Santa Ana. The four hotels are the Golden West uh, Lodge, the Red Roof Inn, Santa Ana Travel Inn, the uh, Civic Center Inn and Suites. The guests of these properties rate their stays, their experiences in Santa Ana essentially as 3.5 out of five stars, three and a half stars. Since 2019, we've hosted about 400 different stays. Over 95% of the guests staying at our guest suite rate us with five out of five stars. And the remaining 4% rate us at four. Nobody rates us below 4%. Now, why is that important? First of all, to average five stars, you have to have a beautiful space, a beautiful home, and provide great service. As an owner-occupied resident of Santa Ana, we take great pride in having a beautiful, well-maintained home. As a matter of fact, we were recently awarded the most beautiful yard award in Morrison Park. This type of care helps us achieve and maintain a five-star rating, which is critical to all hosts having a short-term rental. The second reason why it's important is because five-star experiences equate to economic benefit to the community. Based on our geographic location and the personal recommendations we make, our guests trust us to frequent Santa Ana businesses, restaurants, and such and so forth. We feel that our guests would really not stay in Santa Ana if we do not provide this uh, type of uh, service. As a matter of fact, they would likely uh, stay in Anaheim or in one of the surrounding communities that does allow short-term rentals, but regulated. The um, one final point I'd like to make, we've had over 400 stays. Mr. Suarez, your three minutes are up. With no uh, complaints during those 400 stays. Thank you. I know there's um, quite, quite a, uh, a number of speakers just from the forms that were submitted on this item today. Uh, I think to make sure that you're heard and that um, all that you're, all that you have to contribute is, is within the decision-making process. I would, I would limit the, the speakers that we have, that have already submitted their forms for general, um, for the general comments and encourage you to come back at the time when this item is posted at a more specific date so that you're not repeating yourself. Uh, and again, you know, I, I don't want you to speak your mind now and then not have the opportunity to speak again at, when it really is the time to make the decision on this matter. And so um, how many more speakers do we have uh, already submitted the forms? We have two more speakers for non-agenda items. Chair, if I can also offer that, I know you said the number of um, folks have uh, provided a speaker card wanting to speak on this item. Um, if you didn't leave contact information, if you can please step up and talk to Ali, our planner here, leave you with your contact information. We will be sure to notify you when, with a public notice when the hearings can be heard. So that way you'll have information in the future as to when this item is, this code amendment is going to be heard. So. Um, please see Ali if you didn't leave your contact on the speaker card already. Thank you. Uh, me, uh, Ali.
Next speaker. Next speaker, please. Yeah. Douglas Macbeth. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Douglas McClee, and I'm here also on the item regarding short term rentals. And the reason I came here to speak is because I believe that a blanket ban is going to be overkill. It'd be like taking a cannon to kill a rabbit. And I think that you should consider uh, middle of the road or something less than an outright ban for perhaps the San Jose model versus the Santa Monica model. I think that a lot of the things that are noted as problems with short-term rentals are not established. And in my short time, I'll just give you a little bit of my story. Uh, I'm from Southern California, I lived here all my life, and I moved to Santa Ana in 2005. I live in Park Santiago, and I've been doing Airbnb for many years and I've had no problems at all. It's uh, a lot like the last gentleman that spoke. We've had people from all over the world. There's been no problems with parking. If anything, it's improved the neighborhood. And so I would just note that, um, again, I would reiterate what the last man spoke, that you have to consider the harm that would be done from a blanket uh, restriction. Um, there may be have some few problems, but that can be done by measured ordinance. As far as an outright ban, it would hurt me. It would hurt many other people that need the money. When I started Airbnb, it saved me because I had a child with a birth defect that needed multiple surgeries, and that helped me to get by very difficult times. I think right now there's very difficult times, and if you want to talk about the cost of housing, the people that live here, that are in the community have to face numerous expenses. And if they're living in their home and they have visitors from other countries or out of state, it helps the revenue, it helps Santa Ana, and it helps the community, and it helps the people of Santa Ana. So please be very measured in your response to some uh, certain problems that exist and just target that and consider all of the rest of the needs of the community in Santa Ana. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Austin. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, participate in this evening's meeting to discuss uh, what we consider a very important topic. My name is Richard Austin. I am a resident of Santa Ana. I live in West Floral Park and have been here for over 21 years. And my city council member is Jesse Lopez, Ward 3. I find uh, in today's society, there are very many, very few people that, that are uh, informed about and have uninformed opinions about short-term rentals. They read and they hear in the news and they make their, uh, they make themselves uh, known that they, uh, they don't like it just based off of uninformed information. I'm not directing this a statement at anyone in this meeting. It's just a fact of life. In regards to home sharing or short-term rentals, I've heard all the complaints about the parties, the litter in the streets, the changing of the look of the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. I cannot speak for everyone else, but I can tell you about my and my wife's situation. We've been involved in the home sharing, short-term rental business since 2018. And we always maintain the highest standards and customer satisfaction, which has resulted in, in uh, repeat business and returning customers. We average about six customers a month and an average stay of about two to five days uh, per average. More than 50% are here for Disneyland, and the remainder are here for weddings, graduations, sporting events, and business. We're very centrally located, and that's an enticement for all the people who come and enjoy our home. We have even some of our neighbors that utilize it so that when they have family members come in, it's local, it's convenient, and they love our neighborhood. So even the neighbors have no have any problems with it. So 
Um, because we are on site, we have not encountered any of the complaints that uh, surrounding homeowners or short-term rental partners or noise or litter or anything else. Every one of our guests have been respectful of our home and our neighborhood. In fact, I see more noise, pollution and damage from allowing the fireworks on the 4th of July than what I see with the home sharing of short-term rentals. You have to excuse me, I had to do some. The, uh, the main reason our customers stay with us is because they do not want to stay in hotels. They always tell us that. We don't want to stay at a hotel. We like the convenience and we like the ability just to pull up in front of where we're staying and walk into the, into the room. The income that we derive from our home sharing allows us to maintain our property and it keeps the neighborhood in, Mr. In the Austin, field. your three minutes are up. I was a lot faster when I was practicing at home. <laughs> That's all right. You can uh, come back next time. Gary, Office Plaza, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, uh, council members, for serving the community. I just um, provide some input to what other people are speaking about. Uh, I have two uh, Airbnbs, one behind my house and one next to my house. One is pretty quiet. The other one has had uh, three parties each weekend in a row now. I'd recommend if the council does uh, provide for Airbnbs that they enact some sort of enforcement ordinance. So when the police are called to respond to noisy parties or disruptions, uh, that rather than just wasting their time coming out and saying, oh, that's a civil matter, um, they could actually uh, stop the people that are making the noise or cause the people to turn the music down. Uh, there is a problem that there's not a lot of recourse against the visitor to the Airbnb. You can't sue the visitor practically because they're there one weekend and then they're gone. So you can't really sue them. That's not a practical solution. Um, so it seems like there is a lot of benefits to having it and and having uh some control rather than a prohibition prohibition which would send it underground if you're going to allow it please put in some sort of uh enforcement provisions thank you thank you francisco bahina Hello. I just wanted to start off to say that it's actually Baena for Spanish speakers. Pajina will give you a laugh. So I don't, I just listened to heard about this. So my, whatever this is, it's not very concise, but as, I, as I've heard so far, I've seen, I heard a little bit of the complaints and a little bit of the positives. And it's, it seems like you guys are trying to uh, make a blanket ban on it, which seems, you know, such a black and white thinking tends to not go too well for our people. And there's a lot of benefits as um, myself, I do about a thousand per, per year and I rarely have many issues. And as well, you know, there's a financial benefit to it as well. Business, uh, a lot of people come here for events, family and all that. So I, I, I find, it, find it a little weird to try to slow down business to come down to, uh, to Santa Ana, especially when a lot of the hotels are too expensive. So people would probably not even want to be able to afford them even if they wanted to. I can see the downside because I know there are people that do this as a as a large business, so they could easily take up a lot of property and easily uh, take the make the rent go up in the city. So I do see that as being an issue. But for like the regular people, like people that like me who live in their home, have one or two Airbnb, that's really not an issue. That's not really going to do much when it comes to uh, these kind of issues. So there 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 is room for some type of uh middle ground basically as people have mentioned so a gray area to where you can there should be some kind of what's the word some form of restriction some form of enforcement but at the same time without a complete blanket bl blanket what's it called a ban on it there's plenty of people of cities that have banned it and people still do it so not only are people still doing it there's still going to be safety issues that we're not going to be dealing with because there's no rules enforced or anything like that because of it and um, 
I know this, I guess this is probably not the agenda area or that part of the agenda. The reason we are here to talk about these things is because it does play into our lives. It is important. It helps us pay for things, you know, for school, for our kids, uh, uh, things that they need. Basically, you know, just basic needs, you know. I'm all over the place right now, but I'm trying to think of what else I can add in my 40 seconds here that I couldn't use up. So I'm not sure what this ban really helps with. So that's what I'm trying to figure out here. And that's why I'm here to talk about it as well. And uh, I do, do disagree that talking about it, not talking about it or waiting until the decision has to be made is not the good way to go because you guys have to listen to all these things and it takes time for you to consider a lot of these topics. And if we wait until you guys are gonna make the decision, then it seems like we're probably a little bit too late on that part. Thank you. Thank you. Crystal Peralta. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to support as well um, for the short-term rentals um, for numerous uh, reasons. Uh, first and foremost, um, Sherry and Wesley have been amazing um, bosses to my mom who they have essentially provided um, job opportunities. So taking these short-term rentals essentially takes away the job of somebody else. Um, and we heavily rely on this money um, that and this job opportunity that these um, Airbnb providers have created. Um, additionally, uh, having these Airbnbs and rentals as you have heard, have uh, provided a lot of good things for the city of Santa Ana. Um, and I, when I got here, I saw a lot of orange cones and a lot of blocked streets. Um, and I can already tell that with all this construction that's going on, Santa Ana is only going to improve. And why not have other people from other countries see it? Um, I can tell that Santa Ana is making a lot of progress. And with these short-term rentals, we're only allowing for more people to come and see the beauty of Santa Ana and the beautiful communities that we have here. So essentially taking away these rentals, you're only dragging people away from the city. Um, and so, yeah, please take it into consideration to keep these rentals, um, not only for job opportunities, but essentially to have other people see the beauty of this uh, beautiful community and beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, we do not have any additional speakers. Thank you. Again, I would encourage those who have spoken and we're planning to speak on this matter um, today to come back once uh, a date has been notified, um, just so that yeah, everything that we've heard today can be repeated uh, again at that time. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming. So moving on to the consent calendar, is there a motion to is there a motion to approve item A, minutes from September 12th, 2022? I move. Second. Motion by Commissioner Wu, second by Commissioner McLaughlin. Madam Secretary, please call for roll. Commissioner Alderetti? Yes. Commissioner McLaughlin? Aye. Commissioner Morrissey? Oh, abstain. I'm sorry. I wasn't present for the meeting. Commissioner Ramos? Aye. Commissioner Wu? Aye. Vice Chair Calderon? Aye. Chair Pham? Aye. Motion approved by majority vote with <coughs> Commissioner Morrissey abstaining. Thank you. That concludes the consent calendar. Moving on to the business calendar. I will now review the process for the public hearing so that everyone knows what to expect. Staff will provide a presentation and answer questions from the commission. The public hearing will be open. The applicant will be given the opportunity to speak limited to 15 minutes. Members of the public will be given the opportunity to comment limited to three minutes. 
The applicant will be given the opportunity to respond to comments made by the public limited to five minutes. The public hearing will, will then be closed. Discussion will return to the commission with formal action taken to approve, conditionally approve, deny, or continue review of the application. Please consider the following suggestion when organizing your comments. Please state your name and address, which is voluntary. State whether you support, oppose, or are neutral to the proposal. Your statement should include all pertinent facts within your knowledge. Avoid gossip, emotion, and repetition. A clear and concise and non-repetitive argument is most effective. This is the time and place for public hearing on item number one, amendment application number 2022-01 and the conditional use permit number 2022-114 located at 1700, 1720, and 1740 Gary Avenue. Again, uh, as notified uh, previously, this item uh, will be continued to October 10th. There, is there a motion to continue this item? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Morrissey, second by Commissioner Flocken. Uh, Secretary, please call roll. Commissioner Alderetti? Yes. Commissioner McLaughlin? Aye. Commissioner Morrissey? Aye. Commissioner Ramos? Aye. Commissioner Wu? Aye. Vice Chair Calderon? Aye. Chair Pham? Aye. Motion approved by unanimous consent. Thank you. Next, this is the time and place for a public hearing on item number two, conditional use permit number 2022-15, located at 2929 South Holiday Street. Uh, this item is continued as, as well to um, November 14th, as requested by the applicant. Is there a motion to continue this item? Motion to continue. Second. Motion by Commissioner McLaughlin is second by Commissioner Morrissey. Madam Secretary, please call roll. Commissioner Alderetti? Yes. Commissioner McLaughlin? Aye. Commissioner Morrissey? Aye. Commissioner Ramos? Aye. Commissioner Wu? Aye. Vice Chair Calderon? Aye. Chair Pham? Aye. Motion approved by unanimous consent. Thank you. This is the time and place for public hearing on item number three, uh, density bonus agreement application number 2022-03 and vesting tentative track map number 2022-03 located at 717 South Lyon Street. Please note the decision on this matter is final unless appealed within 10 calendar days by any interested individual or party. Before we begin, do any of the commissioners have anything they wish to disclose with regard to this item? Being seeing no, no disclosures, um, Pedro Gomez will now provide a brief presentation. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and good evening, uh, and good evening to the Planning Commissioners. This next item for your consideration is a request for approval of a density bonus agreement and for a vesting tentative track map to allow construction of a residential townhouse development consisting of 51 townhouse units at 717 South Lyon Street. Uh, the property is approximately 2.3 acres in size, and it's located along South Lyon Street between East Chestnut and East McFadden Avenue. The site is surrounded by multifamily residences in all directions, and it's bounded by the city of Tustin to the east. The property has a general plan designation of medium density residential, and it has a zoning designation of general agriculture, or A1. It is important to note that the application has been submitted pursuant to California Senate Bill 330, or SB 330, known as the Housing Crisis Act. As such, the applicant has selected the corridor district zoning designation within the city's Harbor Mixed Use Transit Corridor Plan as the proposed development standards for the project. Uh, more information about SB 330 is provided in uh, subsequent presentation. 
<clears throat> on this next couple of slides, um, you'll see the existing site photos showing the existing conditions along Lyon Street and within the interior of the property. Uh, the first slide shows the views of the east and northeast along Lyon Street. As existing, there are two one-story structures on the site, one on our northwest corner and the second on the southwest corner. Uh, the next slide shows views of the northeast and southeast within the property. Uh, the site has been vacant since earlier this year. Historically, the site was used for agricultural purposes between 1938 and 1960s. In the 1970s, the Santa Ana Moose Lodge and parking lot, uh, it was a Santa Ana Moose Lodge and parking lot, um, and that continued throughout 1990s. Around 2015, Orange County Electrical Joint Apprenticeship began use of the site as vocational training um, purposes. And as previously mentioned, this project was submitted pursuant to SB 330, uh, known as the Housing Crisis Act or HCA. Uh, the HCA became effective on January 1st, 2020 and established a statewide housing emergency until January 1st, 2025, uh, the Senate bill amended the government code with broad goals of facilitating the increased production of new residential units, uh, protecting existing units, and providing for an expedited review and approval process for housing development projects. On January 1, 2022, the HCA was ex extended until 2030 with the passage of Senate Bill 8. Uh, because the application is being submitted as an SB 330 application, the proposed development site would not be required to be rezoned. In consultation with city staff, the applicant selected the quarter district within the Harbor Mixed Use Transit Quarter Plan as a proposed development standard for the project. Uh, among other stipulations, S3330 requires the following for applicable housing development projects that no new non objective development standards established after January 1st, 2022 can be imposed or enforced that applicable housing development projects must receive a decision in no more than five public hearings. And it prohibits any moratorium project or action that would result in a net down zoning, limit the number of permits to be issued or otherwise reduce housing or limit the overall population. <clears throat> As mentioned, the proposed project includes the construction of 51 townhouse units, in addition to approximately 17,000 700 square feet of open space and 105 parking spaces. As seen on the site plan, the development will consist of 12 residential buildings with three story townhouse units. The structures will each contain a two car garage at ground level with residential units above, with balconies, decks, and some units with a den or flex room. The project will include eight two bedroom units, eight three bedroom units, 22 three bedroom plus den units and 13 three-bedroom units plus den or an optional fourth bedroom. Uh, open space will be provided through uh, several private exterior areas, um, approximately 6,900 square feet in size, or about 7% of the total site area. The design and layout of the proposed open spaces would create a unique outdoor area within the development, which function as a passive outdoor space and provides functional amenities to the residents. On the next two slides, we'll see the proposed renderings uh, and perspectives. The first view is looking east from Lyon Street. And the second is looking down Private Drive uh, towards Building 10. As you can see, the project features a contemporary architectural style similar to many multifamily or mixed-use residential communities under construction in Santa Ana currently. Their overall design, massing, features, and materials of the new construction will be compatible with, but differentiated with the existing multifamily neighborhood. Uh, the contemporary style would include fiber cement lap siding, a light sand finished stucco exterior, fiber cement building trim, metal awnings, and decorative columns, and high quality architectural detailing. Overall, the project will include design and construction material, materials that will ensure the project ages well for the duration of the building's lifetime. Uh, the next couple of slides will highlight the different elevations proposed for a few of the townhouse building types, including the proposed fourplex and fiveplex. So on the screen currently, we have uh, proposed elevations for what's being called fourplex A. We're showing the front and the rear elevations. And on this side, we're showing the side elevations for the same fourplex A. 
This slide shows proposed elevations for what's called fourplex B. Again, we're seeing the front and the rear elevations. And then the side elevations for the same fourplex B. The next slide shows fiveplex C, the front and the rear. And then the side elevations. As designed, the project exceeds the affordable housing goal for the ownership category of the city's affordable housing opportunity and creation ordinance by providing eight on-site units, which will target low income in place of moderate income households as required by the housing opportunity ordinance. <clears throat> Seven of the affordable units will be three bedroom units, while the last unit will be a two bedroom unit. The proposed units will range in size between 1,300 to 1,900 square feet, and this is gross area, not net, uh, and will contain full kitchens, bedrooms, bathrooms, in-unit storage, and open or common living areas. Uh, the California Density Bonus Law allows developers proposing five or more residential units to seek increases in base density in exchange for providing affordable units on site. To help make construction uh, of on-site affordable units feasible, the law allows developers to seek up to three incentives slash concessions and an unlimited number of waivers, which are essentially variances from development standards that would help the project be built without significant burden and without detriment to the public health. Pursuant to the California government code, a local jurisdiction is limited in its ability to deny requests and concessions and waivers and is preempted from denying the density bonus agreement. Due to the project's 23% affordability rate, the developer can seek one density bonus concession and unlimited waivers pursuant to that same California government code. In addition, the developer is requesting a 46.2% state density bonus. As such, the maximum unit yield for the 2.3 acre site using the general plan designation of MR15 in the state density bonus is 52 units. However, the applicant is only proposing 51 units. Uh, you can see on the density bonus calculation breakdown on this next slide that the base density allowed based on just the general plan designation of 15 dwelling units per acre is 35 dwelling units. By providing eight units as affordable, the applicant can request a 46.25% increase to the base density, which allows them uh, an additional 17 units or a total of 52. Again, they're only proposing 51. Um, as mentioned, the applicant has selected the Harbor Mixed Use Corridor Plan um, as a development standards for this project. However, pursuant to the density bonus law, the developer is seeking one concession and three waivers from certain development standards to facilitate the development of the project. Uh, the concession requested is a request to provide less than the required open space percentage. The total common open space required for the project is equal to 15% of the lot or approximately 15,000 square feet. Instead, the project provides about 6,900 square feet or about 7% of the lot, so a difference of 8%. The first waiver requested is to exceed the maximum building setback. The maximum building setback from the public right of way and or easement is eight feet. As proposed, the project is designed to exceed the maximum allowed setback as two of the proposed buildings would be located between nine and 11 feet from an easement line. Uh, the second waiver is a request to exceed the maximum allowable fence height within the front yard area. Uh, for residential zone properties, the fencing height within the front yard is limited to a maximum of three feet in height. The development proposes a six foot tall tubular fencing proposed within that front yard setback. And the last waiver is a request to waive the frontage and floor height requirements. Uh, the development standards in the Harbor specific plan require specific building frontage and minimum floor heights. As proposed, the project design does not provide a frontage type and the ground floor heights are proposed below the minimum required of 10. And so the ground floor height is designed at a minimum of nine feet, one inch. As part of the current entitlement, the applicant has submitted a vesting tentative track map uh, to subdivide the project into a condominium lot with 51 condominium units, which would allow each unit to be sold for individual ownership. The request would vest the right to proceed with the development in substantial compliance with the ordinances, policies, and standards in effect at the time that the vesting map is deemed complete. 
Upon completion of the subdivision, the lots will continue to be used for residential use in the form of the attached unit types that are proposed. In reviewing the project, staff determined that the proposal as conditioned is consistent with the various provisions of the city's general plan. More, moreover, as an SB 330 application, the proposed development does not need to be rezoned as it's been found to be consistent with the objective general plan standards for the property. <clears throat> uh, staff also determined that the proposal is consistent with various provisions of the Harbor plan, including lot size, lot coverage and parking. The applicant has requested a concession and waivers for those development centers that require deviations as were previously analyzed earlier. <clears throat> Uh, further conditions of approval have been included to bring the site's landscaping, architectural design, and the CCNRs to be in compliance with all applicable standards of the Santa Ana Municipal Code and of the Harbor Mixed Use Plan. Uh, further, no ad adverse environmental impacts to fish or wildlife populations were identified as a project site is located as a built out urbanized area. And finally, the tentative track map was found to be consistent with the California Subdivision Map Act and Chapter 34 of the Santa Ana Municipal Code. Uh, staff determined that the overall project satisfies the purpose of the state density bonus law and assists in accomplishing the goal of providing affordable housing opportunities. It provides an opportunity for additional housing and development on the site that would otherwise continue to remain vacant and underutilized. These improvements will help to enhance the quality of life in the surrounding community by providing 51 units for sale, market rate, and affordable housing. And finally, the project has been designed to be compatible with the scale of other residences in the area and will be consistent with the several goals and policies of the general plan, including the general plan's appendix A, which outlines interim development standards for development projects. Uh, staff would like to note that the applicant uh, held two community meetings in conformance to the Sunshine Ordinance notification requirements in place at the time that the application was submitted. Uh, the first meeting was a virtual meeting on March 2nd, 2022. It included a presentation on the project, as well as a question and answer period to address concerns and collect feedback. Uh, participants asked questions about the cost and site security. However, no issues of concerns were raised regarding the proposed development during this meeting. Uh, the second meeting was held virtually on June 1st, 2022. The meeting also included a brief presentation and a summary on the project, as well as a question and answer period to address concerns and collect feedback. Uh, participants asked questions about the project timing, construction impacts, affordability levels, project density and about potential traffic and parking impacts to the community. Uh, in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA, the recommended action is exempt from further review under section 15195 or residential infill exemption as the project meets all the threshold criteria uh, outlined in section 15192, which is the thresholds requirements for exemptions. Uh, based on this analysis, notice of an exemption uh, environmental review number 2022-8 will be filed for this project. And lastly, there is no fiscal impacts associated with this project. Uh, with that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt the resolution approving density bonus agreement 2022-3 as conditioned and adopt the resolution approving vesting tentative track map number 2022-3 as conditioned. Uh, that does conclude staff's presentation. I do want to note that the project applicant and the design team is available in the event that there's any questions that the commission would like to ask of them. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Does the commission have any questions uh, at this time? Commissioner Alder, ready? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question really was, I, I think this looks like a pretty smart project. Uh, I, I, I liked what I saw. I think the one thing that, that concerned me is the 50% is the or more reduction in open space. And so I'm wondering what sort of precipitated that um, decision by, by the developer. If, if the city staff can tell me, that's great. If not, I'll wait for the uh, applicant. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I may refer to the applicant to address that question. Great. I have nothing else. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McLaughlin. Uh, nothing at this time. Commissioner Morrissey. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, likewise, I, I feel like it's a very attractive development, has great curb appeal, but I am concerned about the open space. Um, so uh, I'm wondering what 
what requirements do we have for open space uh, in terms of uh, do we have any specific landscape requirements or how, how do we determine what happens in this open space requirement? Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Let me see if I have, let's see. here we go. Um, the chosen development standards for this project um, call for 15% of uh, the gross site area to be used for open space. Um, because this is a project that's proposing affordable units, um, the state law allows them the opportunity to reduce that. Um, and as mentioned, I think maybe earlier in the conversation, the state law does limit uh, the city um, in preemptively denying any of those concessions or waivers if it's um, deemed to be detrimental to the development of the site. So part of what the staff report analyzed was that if they, the applicant were to provide the 15% affordable or 15% open space, it would require more site area, limiting the number of units that would be proposed or could be constructed on site, which would be detrimental to the project. Um, so that's staff's analysis and it's, I think, could be consistent with developers understanding as well. Okay, but uh, did the developer offer any, was there anything extra provided that would, to offset that? Staff did work with developer to ensure that the open space that is provided um, be improved with high quality amenity spaces, um, seating, barbecue spaces, spaces that are gonna be functional to the residents once it's constructed. And I, I guess my original question was it more specifically when we have open space, do we have requirements for a certain number of trees per square foot or um, planting per square foot or uh, ground cover? Or do we have any specific requirements on those things? That's correct. The chosen development centers do call that out. And as part of the review process for the um, project, staff ensures that what is provided meets the landscape requirements as part of that corridor plan that was selected for development standards. Yeah, I don't have anything further at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ramos, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, thank you. I have uh, two questions. The first one is on the affordable housing being provided. Uh, can staff please go back to the slide that broke down uh, the unit breakdown of the affordable units? Actually, sorry, there was another slide that mentioned something about um, eight units being provided over three. Let me see. So I was a little bit confused by that. Um, so what is the difference between eight on-site units and three for sale units? Or, or yeah, I'm just a little confused there. Sure. Um, the, I'm not sure if this specific language was revised, but the um, Affordable Housing Opportunity and Creation Ordinance requires 10% for for sale, was it 5%, excuse me, 5% for for sale. So that's equivalent to the three uh, that would have been required as moderate income. Um, what's being described here is that the project goes above and beyond that and provides eight for low income for sale. So it's exceeding what would have been required as part of our housing ordinance. Great, thank you. And so those eight units will also be for sale. Eight units will be for sale as well. Okay, great. Thank you on that. Um, and then my other question is also on the open space. So like others, um, I'm a little uneasy about the open space reduction, and I know it's allowable per state law. So I'm wondering, is there a percentage reduction? Uh, is there a limit to how much the open space requirement can be reduced? Like what, what does the state law allow? Because they that reduction from 15 to 7% is over 50% of a reduction. So what, what is allowable by the state? There isn't a defined number. Um, I think the state density bonus puts an onus on local jurisdictions to um, prove that the waiver concession isn't necessary um, for the development of these projects. So what is required for the state density bonuses for an applicant or developer to put in writing their request and to um, outline specifically why they believe it would be detrimental to the project. So in reviewing this, the applicant did just that, um, citing that this percentage of uh, open space is the minimum that they could require to, uh, they could provide in order to make the project feasible and for the project to be built and for the project to provide the eight units of affordable. Otherwise, if it was above and beyond that, the project would not be feasible. 
Okay. Um, so then a, an additional question, maybe not as specific to the, pro to the project, but to what you just mentioned. So if an applicant can prove that providing any open space makes their project unfeasible, then they can essentially eliminate any open space requirements that are general plan um, and any, uh, any plans require. It's actually, I believe the other way around, the city has to prove that. Um, okay. The state law says that in writing or in person that the applicant can request this. Um, and it's the onus is on the city to say, no, or you know, this is why we believe that you can provide the open space. But in our analysis and a staff report, um, even though this is not the 15% open space that's um, required as part of the order plan, um, staff deemed this as appropriate in order to make the project feasible. Okay, uh, thank you. Those are all my questions for staff. And uh, I think like others said, I would also like to hear from the applicant when it's their turn on why that reduction was necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wu. Um, there isn't much that we can say or do because we have to follow the state mandate. Uh, I was wondering if there's anything as a, as a charter city uh, that gives us a little more say. I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I asked. Uh, the the other thing is that uh, that that last statement there, the Orange County uh, medium income is currently at one hundred eight thousand four hundred. Uh, it's adjusted to allow for a four person household. So when an applicant for the property can combine the income of those uh, people residing in the household, right, to make that. You know, that's a good question. I'm not familiar with the income requirements and how that would go about, but just so you know, our density bonus agreement that's uh, included as part of the reporting process, um, we've worked with our housing division and our housing division um, works with um, the applicant and what would be the CCNRs and in the event that there were that property to be sold to ensure that the income levels are being met. In the agreement, there's an income verification form that's attached as um, kind of an exhibit to this. And so that's what they use to ensure that well, whoever's buying the property for those um, restricted units or affordable units are uh, going to the right people. For the size and scope of this project and all the concession and and not putting a lot of restriction, I could see how this came about. Uh, but in, in another general thinking, uh, the affordable housing end of it, we seem to be meeting very well. Is that the worker housing at the low, very low income that uh, we don't seem to be meeting as much need? And we have heard from even unions that said that their members cannot find, you know, housing uh, uh, in Santa Ana. So um, uh, while this might not reflect this overall project here, uh, we might also think about as you work with a developer to see if. Um, they can include more of very low. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Vice Chair, you have any comments? Yeah, just one question. Um, are any of the units <clears throat> allowed to have a loft or do they have lofts? That's that's what, like another term that they use for like flexible space or okay. den area. Um, there's some designs that are um, with an option as a flex space and, that, and even more with an option for a fourth bedroom. So it just depends on during construction, uh, if there's uh, a need for it or demand for it, or if like prospective buyers would like to opt in for a fourth bedroom or just keep the loft that's at the time of purchasing. Awesome, point. thank you. Thank you. Uh, a few um, questions on the number of affordable units. Uh, is it the case that in order for the applicant to qualify for a density bonus, uh, they would need to provide at a minimum three um, um, low-income units. Thank you, Chair. You know that exact percentage. I don't know on the top of my head, but it's a it's a limited. I want to say maybe five percent, but it could be wrong. Right. Okay. Uh, but it is a small percentage of affordability to to qualify for density and qualify for concessions. And the amount of density, the amount of concessions, just depends on the affordability rate that they end up providing. And so the the A on site units is, um, I'm assuming, it's more than what what would have been asked. 
by, by, by the city and by the state? It is more than what the city would require for moderate. Um, I, I think our code only um, talks about moderate, but um, this table, I think, does a great job of explaining kind of what that percentage affordability rate is. Um, and when we do analysis on this, it's based on that base density. So at 23% affordability, they're allotted a 46.25 increase. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a couple other questions. Uh, can you clarify, um, I know we're, the developer's asking for a concession and three waivers, what the difference between a concession and a waiver is? As, as staff understands the definitions of definitions, concessions, and waivers in the state code, um, they're more or less in line with uh, any sort of development standard would prohibit the construction of the project. So um, if you were to ask me, um, I'd say it's about the same. It's a concession or a waiver. It's just, you know, one of them maybe is more specific to a development standards and the other ones may be more specific to some of these like open spaces um, fencing that may not be traditional setbacks or lot coverage or anything like that. Okay, I guess I was I was curious if they had anything to do with our discretion on the issues. Um, so, are these how much discretion do we have on these four issues? Are these mandatory, or are we being asked to make a finding that they're they're very uh, limited? Um, I, as I mentioned in that slide, I, I think the state law is written in a way where it makes it. Um, the city's, you know, it's the city's onus to kind of provide information as to kind of why these concessions are not needed. So if you commission were to decide that you'd like to make a recommendation against one of these concessions, you'd have to outline exactly why you feel that that would not be necessary. Um, okay, thank you. That, that clarifies it. Right. To piggyback on, uh, on Commissioner Morrissey's comment, uh, can you expand more on why why the need for a concession for the architectural frontage? I can. Um, our codes, um, our development standards, they're not an exact science. Um, with the adoption of our general plan, um, we had five focus areas. And those five focus areas, um, I guess the general plan kind of preceded any sort of zoning that would follow, right? So right now there's kind of this limbo situation where um, the general plan changed a couple of land uses and the zoning is not there yet. So in the interim, the general plan adopted in Appendix A um, that these are development <laughs> standards that can be used in the interim of when the city can get the zoning in place. Um, what happens as part of S3330 projects is the same idea. Uh, when you have a zoning that's not quite there, so an A1 zoning wouldn't allow this project, a developer could come in and build based on the base density unit of the general plan. But because there's no development standards that would support this, the developer can choose one of those development standards identified on the Appendix A. So Appendix A, the, the Harbor Specific Plan was written with Harbor in mind, and it was written to create this um, kind of, you know, walkable Harbor alternative modes of transportation. When you try to put that on Lion Street, it doesn't quite match up. So some of these standards just inherently aren't going to work. Um, so that's the reason for this request. We can't staff just waive that. So there's just the tool to use to waive that. Thank you. Um, that's um, all comments from myself. No other comments? Madam Secretary, uh, have we received any written communication or is there a member of the public that would like to comment on this item? We have not received written communication. It looks like we have a request to speak for item number three. Chair, if we can allow the applicant to first speak on the matter or ask any question before you go to the public comments. Okay. The public hearing is now open. Would the applicant like to speak on the matter? Uh, good evening, Chairperson, members of the commission. Thank you for having me. My name is Joe Optley with Warmington Residential. Um, first, I want to say that you have the best staff in the business, absolutely phenomenal throughout the whole process. So I want to thank them for all the work that they've done to get us to this point. I'm sure you already know that, but they're great. Um, in response to some of the questions, um, 
it, it seemed like it was primarily focused on the reduction in open space. Um, that, that's really just a, uh, a function of the site constraints. So we have a lot of easements, both on the north and the frontage, that require us to kind of squeeze everything in. So in order to make the finances work, to get the density that we need to make it work for all the affordable we're providing, it just eats up open space. One thing to note is we more than I think we're more than double the private open space. So we get pretty close to the overall open space that's required, although it's a split between private versus common. So it's a little bit different of open space that people can use from patios or decks uh, versus kind of a communal area that um, we have, like you said, less less than required. So it's really a function of density on that one in site constraints. Um, I don't know if there's any other specific questions that I missed. I can answer for you. Does the commissioners have any uh, question for the applicant? Commissioner, all ready? No, no questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McLaughlin? Uh, no questions. Commissioner Morrissey? Yeah, I, I don't have any questions this time. Thank you. Commissioner Ramos? Yes, I do have one question on the unit breakdown of the affordable units. Uh, how was it decided what the size of the affordable units would be? Uh, they're exactly the same as our market rate units, and we did an even distribution between the plant types and throughout the project. So we have, the, we have like uh, seven of one unit, seven of another unit, and then we did one in, affordable in each of those plant types. We have four plant types, and they're evenly distributed based on the number of units we have in plant types on the project. And then they're spread out through the site. Okay, I think maybe I got a little bit confused. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you have two bedroom, and this is for the entire site. You have two bedroom units, three bedroom units, uh, three bedroom units that also have a den, and three bedroom units that have a den uh, slash could be used as a fourth bedroom. Plan one, um, we have eight of those units on site, seven of them will be market rate, one will be affordable. For plan Sorry, can you uh, remind me what plan one is? Thank you. That's the two bedroom unit. Okay. So there's one of those will be affordable um, of the eight of those. For plan two, this is a three bedroom unit. There's eight of those, one of them will be affordable. Um, plan three is three beds with a den. We have 22 of those. We're providing four of those at the affordable rate. And then plan four is the three beds with the den optional. We have 13 of those and we're providing two. Okay, great. Thank you. I had misheard and I thought, um, yeah, I had misheard and didn't understand that the some of the affordable units would also be those with the den. Um, and you also said that, was it at least one of them would be the three bedroom with the den that could be the optional bedroom? Yeah, two of those. Two of those. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, I really like asking these questions to make sure that the breakdown is in concentrating all the affordable units and the smaller unit size. Right. Uh, and by any chance, do you have um, any images that show where the affordable units are located on the property? Yeah, our site plan should show that. Um, if you see the square that says AF, I, I know that has a different connotation for some people, but um, it's affordable. So you'll see those across the site on different, every unit or every building pretty much has one kind of throughout the site. Okay, thank you for uh, making sure they were dispersed throughout the site. That's all for me. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wu. Uh, how energy efficient are these units? Uh, about as energy efficient as you can get. They're 21st century townhomes. They'll be solar powered. Um, all will come standard. You got solar power. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Um, all water efficient, um, dual plane windows. Uh, it's about as efficient as you get. And electric stove? Uh, to be to be determined. Or at this point, we don't know. Um, the new code is coming out in 2023 uh, in January, so it'll determine what kind of um, electrification requirements uh, are going to be. Are you be planning there. for charging units for electrical? They'll power? be pre-wired every garage. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a speculative question, just from my understanding for future developments like this, where we are making more concession to get more housing. Um, uh, if you go up one more light, if, if since so you could get a concession, can you get more open space or uh, create four bedroom units with four baths? Um, and would the cost be any different or? Yeah, four, four, you mean four stories, you go up to four yeah. stories? 
um, not really conducive to what we do. It, sometimes that'll change the building type that you're building and the construction costs tend to go up on that. So you'll see a lot of three story and then they kind of go up a, lot, a little bit higher, more like five or six at that point because you're changing the construction type. So it is di more difficult for us to do that. Not typical for what we're doing on these type of developments. Thank you. That helped me to, to get in the head of developers when they're looking at sites. You might see that for some apartment types. These are all for sale. So you might see some different um, product types that are different for uh, rental that might get you to the four stories. I'm looking at the state regulations and increasing densities in their neighborhood and seem like no other way to go except up without getting to looking like Hong Kong. You know, um, how, how do you manage that? And, and um, stack housing can seem to be a new wave of going. So I was just curious. Yeah, it, it's appropriate in some locations. I think there are areas of Santa Ana that, that, would, that would work for sure. Um, we kind of look at the scale and the people around us and the properties adjacent to us to try to determine what would be appropriate and then also what's financially feasible. And we felt three-story townhomes for sale was appropriate here. Thank you for your information. Thank you, Commissioner Vice Chair. Yeah, just uh, one question I might have missed it. Uh, what is the average square footage for uh, the units? I don't have an average right here, but it's like gonna be 1,700 square feet, 1,800 square feet, somewhere in that range, okay. just for basic. I, I don't know that to be 100% right, That's right. All right, in that range. That's all right, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, are you able to disclose um, the, um, the unit price uh, for, for these? Um... I can give you a range. All right. So the Department of Real Estate can't let me give out specific pricing, right. but I'll say they'll be in the 700s for the market rate. Um, right now, if I were gonna sell, the low affordable, it'd be about two hundred thousand. Okay. Any, any additional uh, comments or questions from the commission? No. Okay. We'll now take comments from the public, uh, Madam Secretary. Do we have any members of the public that would like to comment? Thank you for your presentation. If you are attending this meeting in person and would like to comment on this item, please fill out a request to speak form and turn it into the secretary. If you are participating via Zoom and would like to comment on this item, please select the hand icon and unmute yourself. If you are calling in and would like to comment on this item, please dial star nine and press star six to unmute yourself. I will wait a few seconds. We have Ms. Uh, Vasquez, uh, who will be coming in person. Hola a todos, mi nombre es Heidi. Um, uh, disculpe, sorry, staff, can we please get interpretation? Yes, um, me hace un favor, por favor, baje el micrófono para poderlo oír mejor. Muchas Ay. gracias. Okay. Uh, hola a todos, mi nombre es Heidi. Este, pues es la primera vez que estoy aquí, estoy un poquito nerviosa, sorry eh, por, por los nervios. Este, uh, pues solamente quería yo uh, decir que estoy contenta eh, por el proyecto que están este, mostrando aquí. No sé uh, cuáles son como los, uh, los pros, los contras de, de este proyecto, este como um, en la ciudad, pero personalmente este, uh, como sociedad o, o persona estoy contenta porque veo como a futuro este, por fin tener una casa propia. Este, tengo 15 años um, rentando uh, sobre ahí mismo, sobre la, la, donde está el proyecto. Este, y ahora lo veo como un, algo realizado para que tenga un hijo de, de colegio que está en el college y su propósito de él es comprar una casa. So, ahorita eh, estoy a favor de todo lo que están haciendo. Este, no sé cuáles son como los, um, de nuevo, los pros, los contra de eso, si, si a las personas que puedan calificar, pero este, Espero que se, que se haga todo. Thank you. We'll, um, do you need some time to? Hi, everyone. My name is Heidi. 
Um, I am here. I'm terrified to be here. It's my first time and I'm a bit, a bit nervous. I just wanted to say that I don't know how things work in the city, but she's personally uh, happy, uh, happy as well as a, uh, as a society to see how this um, housing project is going to be built. She's been renting at the site for 15 years. I'm not sure if, um, is it la donde usted vive? Sí, vivo um, enfrente. Oh, she's been living, she said at the site, but she just clarified that she lives across the street um, from the project site. And that, um, that she's very happy to see that the project is going on, that she's in, in support of it and that she has a, a child in college and that their hope is to buy a place and they're happy to see this, um, hoping that this is going to become a reality. Uh, she doesn't know how you know, to qualify and how to go about it, uh, but that she is in support of the project. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, I understand a little, but my English no is very well, so I prefer speaking in Spanish. So, thank Está you. Bien, thank you. Okay. Haber venido. Gracias. Thank you. Our second in-person uh, speaker, Mr. Manny. Ten thirty two West Park Lane, uh, Santa Ana. Yeah, I think it sounds great too, and uh, great work putting this together. Um, I really think it's great that the affordable housing is included. I think that's really important. Um, I also hear the concern about open space, and um, there's a little bit of back and forth. It's kind of confusing, but what I get is that the commission could say we we want some more, right? I mean, uh, that would be my recommendation as a resident to leave the amount of affordable the same don't reduce any of that but maybe take a couple of the market rate units out and plant some more trees for the quality of life that everybody is going to have living there um, with global warming we need more trees more green space other than that i think it's a great project thank you thank you We do not have any um, comments via Zoom. Chair, we do not have any more speakers. All right. Thank you. The public hearing is now closed. Is there a motion and is there a second? I, I have a few um, comments yet. Go ahead. Um, I think. Um, Open space is, is really vital to our physical and mental wellness. Um, there's you know a lot of reasons for that. We've we've discussed in the past. Um, hot days like this reduces the the temperatures and the development, uh, reduces stress. It's been shown to boost our immune systems, so on and so forth. And we're doing this a lot. We're we're granting concessions on open space, and we hear it from the public a lot how how they want it, and how important it is. So um, I, I think we need to find a way to um, offset that somehow. And I, I think there's ways to do that uh, on the site. Um, that's why I was asking about, you know, how many trees we usually require in, in open space. So if we're short 8,000 square feet, how many, how many trees, how much landscape are we short? Is there a way to make that up? Um, the, other, the other factor is, is heat islands. Um, is there a way to, uh, I'm sure there is a way to, um, um, require reduced heat islands, maybe through, uh, compliance with, uh, lead. Um, there's, there's any number of a dozen different ways they can reduce the heat island effect. So, uh, I think there's ways to offset it. Um, I, I realize our, our opportunities to reduce the number of units or, you know, we really can't do that, but uh, I think we can offset the, um, the shortage of open space. So I'm uh, hoping uh, my commissioners can, our commission can get behind some sort of initiative to uh, offset that open space. Interested to see what everybody else, uh, everybody else's thoughts are. Yeah, 
any commissions that would like to comment? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I kind of go along with the commission, Commissioner Morrissey. You know, we have been trying to increase the green, the open space in the city, and it is one of the key items that's on the agenda for the council and everybody else. And I know this is a small amount, but I think if we didn't ask the question again, didn't get, you know, put our heads together, I think it would be a tragedy for, for the planning commission at this point in time. And so um, my feeling is, is that if anything, uh, I would recommend continuing this for the next, till the next meeting so that we could possibly come up with some alternatives that might be acceptable under the circumstances. Please go ahead. If I may, Chair. Um, <clears throat> the staff report makes mention of this, and I kind of alluded to um, certain language earlier, but I, I found the exact language that I was referring to. So in 2017, the state density bonus law was amended to restrict the ability of local jurisdictions to require studies to justify the density bonus and requested incentives, waivers, and places the onus on local jurisdictions to prove that incentives and concessions or waivers are not financially warranted. The analysis that was provided for the open space, <clears throat> that by providing the required open space standard, the 15%, would lead to the elimination of a minimum of three or more units, uh, which would affect the feasibility to construct the project. Uh, in order to contain the, the current units that are proposed, the developer would be required to construct additional floor areas, which as was described earlier by the developer, would um, result in a different building type, increasing the cost of the project and making it infeasible. In addition, it would exceed the allowable height requirements as part of that chosen Arbor corridor plan. Um, so I just wanna make sure that you uh, as a body understand that um, before any sort of decisions are made. And doesn't the law go further by saying that we cannot uh, to use continuance, uh, I'm not, I don't have any support here, but I just remember you saying that, that well, we can't use studies, continuance, and other things to delay the project. That's a great point. In other point. words. Uh, That's a great uh, point, Commissioner. Uh, SB 330 does limit the public hearing meetings to five, and it does count this as one continuous and two city council has to be a third. So um, all of this you know, should be considered by the uh, planning commission before a decision is made. But yes, uh, Commissioner was correct. Uh, SB 330 descriptions as were provided earlier do limit public hearings to five. And I didn't want to be correct, but I, did, I was listening. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I um, I, I think what Commissioner McLaughlin and Commissioner Morrissey, the, the subject that's being brought up, I think is valid, just because I know that um, we have these discussions um, outside of this project, but outside of the, the discussion about whether or not we have enough uh, open parkland in the city and the increase, uh, the increase in, in unit count obviously will offset the amount of open space that, that we'll, we'll, we'll need, right? Um, but again, I don't think it's fair to penalize or, or put these, um, these items or, or these discussion on this specific project so because it was designed with the standards that, that were that were given to to the applicant and but it's beyond this project i think it's something that's worth discussing uh for future projects and future concessions where not um you know we we have an increased unit count but at a deficit of parks beyond that project scope which is a discussion uh, by itself uh, as for the commissioners who, who wish to to second or to continue this item, if if there if you want to continue it, there has to be a, a clear kind of um a, a clear goal that that you want to see that staff is uh, that's achievable by staff uh, within the next uh, next um, date. Well, so can you communicate yeah. that? Let me, let me ask the question. I mean, we do this with other projects, and that is, is that. You know, for instance, I mean, does this project have to contribute to the school district for the construction? Does it have to contribute to the parks for construction? They're required to pay all 
development impact fees, including the park fees. Okay. I mean, I'm thinking as an example, we could have a, a park that's not necessarily near there, but close to there could be upgraded and, and helped cl cleaned up, you know, repurposed, however we want to look at it. And their fee would go to the city's um, current revenue um, savings for that area of the city uh, to provide for potentially creation of additional park, but also for making improvements to any existing facility right. as well. Right. I mean, when when the homes that were built on, on um, Flower Street, on the north end of Flower Street, the park, John, uh, Jack Fisher Park, received like $300,000 to upgrade the, the gear that's in the the gear that's in the park itself and clean up some of the other things about the park but it's just adjacent to it it's not inside the same boundaries it's adjacent to it i think you know as as we have discussed with the commission in the past is that affordable project and housing development are hard to create without some level of um, concessional waivers uh, in this case, the state law actually requires it of the city. But just looking in the context of this project, you're looking at a project that are providing for ownership opportunity at a very deep affordable rate. I think the developer mentioned that at the low income level they're providing, that's $200,000 for a 1,700 unit house. Eight of these will go to <clears throat> Santa Ana residents who will be have the opportunity to have own home ownership. And I think when you look at that in the totality of the open space that's being requested, I think that's where you want to weigh um, the issue of housing, affordability, and in this one case, open space. This is not for all housing development in the city, but for this partic one particular case. I think that's where the commission should look at it from that perspective instead of the totality of the issues that we have in open space. The project is also providing for um, private open space for the units. And I think the common open space that are being proposed provide for amenities that will make it useful for the residents there as well. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the Commissioner McLaughlin's suggestion is uh, a good one. It's another option, I think, to compliance. You still provide the, the same number of affordable homes. You're just offsetting or creating an alternative to the open space, um, either through weed compliance, additional trees, whatever that might be for the weed compliance, you know, permeable pavers, reflective roofing, whatever the case might be. But it, it provides an alternative to the effects of not having that open space. What we could do is work with the applicant to incorporate any opportunity that we can to soften some of the hardscape uh, and to potentially look at providing for additional landscape area or landscape amenities instead of over area. Um, we can work with them on that um, so that it's um, anywhere there's opportunity for additional um, shrubs, trees, we would work with the applicant to, to provide that. This is Commissioner Alderetti. I, I just I, I'm I'm listening to to this discussion, and I'm wondering if we're not trying to sort of create an in lieu fee for for a park. It it seems to me that's where we're headed, where we're we're asking this developer to contribute to whatever the amount of money is to for an in lieu fee to help a park that's in the area. Is is that kind of where this is? I mean, is that a correct? representation of what where this discussion is going? Not to my understanding. What what I'm hearing is that potentially working with the applicant to look at some of the hardscape on site to look at possibly provide for a softening of that. Yeah. And then anywhere that there is landscaping on the site that could use or add more higher uh, density of vegetation, we would be able to work with the applicant on that. Got it. Not a, it's not a, a, a in lieu fee. The project is already going to have to pay its impact fee for development of park as part of their permitting process. So that's not the discussion. Got it. Okay. Thank you.
discussion? Yeah, so it, would the uh, applicant be willing to work with staff to um, help mitigate the open space through additional amenities? Is that is that something that applicant would be willing to do? You can go and approach the... Um, if you could clarify what amenities are, if we're talking about what Min is saying is adding more trees and other things, yeah, we're well, you know, open to that. Increasing the open space is not really an option. Our, our site's already constrained enough to provide additional square footage on a site plan, but we're already pretty well landscaped. We haven't shown a, a landscape plan that shows the trees. It's pretty lush landscaping. It's not like there's a whole lot of opportunities to plant more trees, but we would, if there is, we'll work with staff to do that. And we pay a, a, a calculation is a little over 330,000 in park and loop fee for this project. Park fee, yes. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, was that bad? Yeah, yeah, I think we just need to offset the, what the benefits that that additional uh, open space would provide, you know, reduced heat islands, um, shade um so you know the additional trees and maybe some enhanced um paving you know would do that thank you, you know, commissioner not, not asking for additional area or anything like that just we need to offset the uh, negative impacts yeah what i can offer as a suggestion and of course if the developer is amenable um we typically require 24 box size trees um so if the concern is about you know maturity of the trees and providing a shade in a more kind of short time, perhaps the, you know, developer may be amenable to a 36 inch box tree. Um, you know, maybe a tree that's a little bit more mature to provide more shade sooner um, uh, in addition to working with them. Commissioner Morrissey, would you be? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that sounds fine as, as long as we're creating an offset I think if you again, if you look at the the lead requirements for heat islands, they have a shopping list of about I don't know, ten to twelve ways to do that. Is there a motion to verbalize what we've discussed? Um, I move we approve item number three. Commissioner Morse, do you want to amend the, the motion to include yeah. what, what we've discussed? 2022-03. Right. We should adopt a resolution uh, approving the density bonus agreement, 2022-03 as condition, and adopt resolution approving the existing Tentative track map number 2022 03 as condition and the discussion about the offset. And Is there a I second? Propose a, a friendly amendment to that, just an addition uh, to offset the, uh, to, to create an equivalent. Uh, benefit of open space work with the client work work with the the uh, applicant to create equivalent benefit of open space on site yeah i did say that but i guess i, I think that's a hard measure to to establish um i would recommend that uh allow staff the conditions to allow staff to work with the applicant to maximize the on-site landscaping and its benefit Because we may not be able to achieve what you're asking for if there's a 50% reduction and to make that the equivalent. And I believe that's that's something that needs that we would need the flexibility to work with the applicant to increase and maximize what's on site. In terms of the landscape, um, planting, and any area that can be softened uh, from hardscape and incorporate any type of energy efficient, elite efficient um, strategies. Yeah, but, well, they might already be there when you count it in. May, the, yeah, but, but I think to set a hard standard and if we're not able to meet it, that's gonna be very challenging 
because we would also have to go through the process of evaluating what's the benefit that you know may or may not be as part of the landscaping requirements. So I think the better standard for for us in terms of working with the applicant is what I recommended. Well, I, I think this is all part of the analysis. You know, we, we talked about um, the commission um, creating a finding. So the onus is on us to create a finding that it's either adequate or inadequate. And I think we need to go through that process. If if you can work with them to to create an equivalent, then I think that's doing our due diligence. I, I think to provide a substandard, so basically we're approving a substandard housing for for people that need affordable housing. So I, I, that's not our goal. Our goal is to provide standard housing, provide the equivalent type of development someone who who doesn't isn't low income would have. I don't disagree with that statement that you just made. We are in complete agreement. What we're looking at here is a state um, mandate that we do take affordable housing as the priority and that's what the law has been put in place for so that these type of consideration while it's very important locally i'm not saying it's not but this is where the state has been very clear about what concession what waiver is being requested and what a city can require yeah uh, that's I think if we're providing affordable housing, it, it should meet the same criteria as non-affordable housing in terms of green space. I, I, I understand. I get um, Chair and commissioners, I would just add or echo what Director Tai has said in terms of your ability to um, deny concessions or incentives proposed by the developer. Um, while that authority certainly has not been removed by state law, um, state law sets the standard or fairly high um, for the commission to make that choice. And specifically, um, the city is required to grant a concession or incentive proposed by a developer unless it can find in writing based on substantial evidence that the proposed concession or incentive does not result in identifiable and actual cost reductions or would cause a public health or safety problem. So the grounds on which um, a concession or an incentive can be refused in a context like this are fairly limited. It must be done um, based on a, a written finding, based on substantial evidence. I know that's what um, Mr. Gomez and Director Tai have said this evening, but I thought it would be helpful to offer a brief summary of the basis on which a concession like this um, you know, can be refused. Um, state law is, is quite prescriptive on that measure or on that note. Uh, Commissioner Morrissey, uh, I would agree with you that I, I would like to see more open space and things uh, that'd be nice, regardless of income, but especially for uh, providing low-income housing. But I think that the way they're taking advantage on the small lot to provide as much affordable housing as they can, um, they... Uh, they maximize it according to uh, SB 330. And, and because of that, it's unique in some way because it, it sets the priority different from, from what we might look at other projects that have more room where they could do it and all that. They don't, you know. Uh, it's a kind of housing we don't like to see that's crowded and but to everything else. But the state says, yeah, they can do it if you give them the concession and the state says you got to give concession so unless we come up and say uh no we deny it for these reasons which i haven't heard what we could deny it other than on, on that we should have more open space on, on a property that we can't have open space so i guess i'm just i'm not pushing for this project as much as i am seeing that what else can we do i mean it's here they work with them as much as they could and it's, it's squeezing a box into a, a little uh, area that will not get, unless they go up. And I try to see if we could go up more to create that space. So, so we either voted on it and then voted down, or we, we got to find a finding to reject it. 
Commissioner Ramos. Yes, uh, just hearing what the commissioners would like to see and also understanding the constraints that we have, um, I would like to recommend to whoever is making the motion or making a friendly amendment to the motion that the language be worded in such a way that requires a meeting to take place where those options are explored. I know we've done that in the past and it might not be as strong as we would like, um, but when I recommended that language in the past, it seemed that that was the strongest we could go. So at least requiring a meeting to take place, I think is better than saying just exploring the options because we don't know what that would look like. I think what, um, just so to summarize, it, it sounds like the recommendation is for us to maximize, and that's the intent, is to maximize what we can do with the site, with the applicant, um, so that it's something that we would strive to provide as much benefit as possible for the project. But what we're saying is that don't stipulate so that it has to be equal. That's the standard that it's very um, hard to achieve if we're not going to have this open space area to do it with. But we will work with the applicant to maximize all the benefits in those areas uh, that the site can provide. I believe currently we have a motion by Commissioner Wu to adopt the resolution as approved, as condition uh, resolution. 2022-03 and the tentative track map 2022-03. We have an friendly amendment from Commissioner Morrissey to uh, to ask that um, in lieu of the uh, reduction of, of um, open space that a equal. Um, I'm sorry, can I ask Commissioner Ramos to restate? I'm not sure I understood what, what her comment yeah, was. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure how your friendly amendment was initially going to be worded, but um, I think what I did in the past was require that a meeting take place between the developer and staff to then explore, uh, and then you could add the things that you would hope that they would explore. I think what I would mean, mean before a, a suggestion is this. Uh, we pass the recommendation as is, it is written up there on one and two, and that uh, we direct staff to maximize uh, in working with the developer uh, as much as possible to provide the benefits that we have discussed here today regarding open space. It's your friendly amendment. It's up to you to incorporate both commissioners' um, language uh, into your friendly amendment. Yeah, I'm trying to capture both of you guys. Uh, yeah, that, that works for me. Okay. Well, that's to meet with staff, too. So okay. that's my motion. To maximize the uh, benefits to the residents in terms of open space by working with the uh, staff, working with the developer as, a, as addition to the one and two. Uh, will you be incorporating Commissioner's uh, Ramos' language of uh, requiring to meet the staff? No, the requirement would be putting a, a thing too hard on it by, by allowing staff to work with uh, yeah. the developer to maximize it. I think uh, uh, allow us not not to have, have found a negative finding and then not be in compliance with SB 360. I would like to make a substitute motion. Go ahead. Uh, I don't have the agenda up, but essentially uh, approving, so going with staff's recommendation to adopt the resolution, approving density bonus agreement 2022-03 as condition, uh, adopting a resolution, approving investing tentative track map number 2022-03 as condition, and requiring a meeting between the staff and the developer to explore ways um, to, and then I would like to pass the mic to uh, our fellow commissioner to see if you would like to recommend language that can go in that link. So did you just substitute your motion without, uh, a, we, I did not get a second on mine, right? So you just substituted yourself or what? what I thought there was a second on your motion. Huh? Currently, there hasn't been a second on on your your, your first motion. Um, I think Commissioner Morrissey was still debating on the, the wording to his friendly amendment to Commissioner Wu's. Uh, if yeah, I... 
so Ms. sure we, we were requiring a meeting, but I, I want more the language stronger than exploring options. I think we need to implement. Uh, there needs to be an implementation. So just point of clarification for uh, the, proce the procedure. Do we need to call for a second for the first uh, motion that was made before being able to recommend a substitute motion? So there was a motion made. Um, Commissioner Ramos made a substitute motion. If there is no second for the substitute motion, then it would be appropriate to go back to the original motion. And, and I'll, I'll withdraw my motion, uh, but if there's a strong language, I'm gonna have to vote against it. Okay, so the original motion by Commissioner Wu has been withdrawn. There is a second motion by Commissioner Ramos. Um, can you please repeat your Yes, yeah, so uh, I move to adopt the resolution approving density bonus agreement number 2022-03 as condition, to adopt the resolution approving vesting tenant of track map number 2022-03 as condition, and, requ and to require a meeting between staff and the developer to explore additional options to maximize um, the benefits that additional open space would have created. And, and my, I'm open to friendly my amendments. friendly amendment is to uh, add the language, explore and implement um, options to maximize. I will I'll accept that. All right. So we have a motion by Commissioner Ramos and a friendly amendment by Commissioner Morrissey. Madam Secretary, can you uh, repeat the motion with the friendly amendment, please? For the substitute motion, adopt a resolution approving density bonus agreement number 2022-03 as conditioned, adopt a resolution approving vesting tentative track map number 2022-03 as conditioned, and require meeting between staff and developer, developer to explore and implement options for open space. Uh, to explore and implement options before uh, the to vote. maximize open space. And I didn't get a second yet. But uh, just so before you take the vote on that, staff can work with that motion if it's uh, supported. I want to make sure that we have the applicant here that they would uh, can work with that as well. It looks like it's yes. So okay. So for the record, we, um, we have confirmation from the applicant that he's amicable to the suggestions uh, put forth. We have a motion. Can do I have a second? Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Ramos with an amendment by Commissioner Morrissey and a second by Commissioner McLaughlin. Uh, Madam Secretary, please uh, call vote. Commissioner Alderetti. Commissioner McLaughlin. Aye. Commissioner Morrissey. Aye. Commissioner Ramos. Aye. Commissioner Wu. Vice Chair Calderon. Aye. Chair Pham. Aye. Motion approved by majority vote with Commissioner already absent. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we're at this time in place for public hearing on item number four, the zoning ordinance amendment number 2022-03. Uh, as notified earlier, this item will be continued at a later date. Uh, staff will notify um, interested parties on the date, and I encourage you to come back again um, to present your um, your presentation. Is there a motion to continue this item? And not not this time. We're going to go through the proceedings. <coughs> not this time. I have a motion to continue. We have a motion to continue by Commissioner Morrissey. Do I have a second? All second. We have a second by Vice Chair Calderon. Madam Secretary, uh, please call roll. Commissioner Alderetti. Commissioner McLaughlin. Aye. Commissioner Morrissey. Aye. Commissioner Ramos. Aye. Commissioner Wu. Aye. Vice Chair Calderon. Aye. Chair Pham. Aye. Motion approved by majority vote with Commissioner already absent. This will conclude the business calendar. Um, 
again, this, this isn't the time for public comments. Um, it, we'll have to go through our proceedings first. We're going to comments from the staff of the commissioners. The staff or the commissioners have any comments, general comments? We have none. Commissioners. Yeah, uh, just a quick comment. Um, uh, that we're having, uh, there's a lot of street improvements in our area. So I, I see members of public, public works here. I'd like to thank them for all their efforts to on the sidewalk improvements and uh, paving that's going on in our neighborhood and throughout the, our neighborhood in particular, but throughout the city. Nice work out there. And um, the regarding the streetcar, uh, a lot of um, great efforts gone into maintaining accessibility to um, Latino health access and Nova Academy. So everything's running smoothly there. So I appreciate all the, appreciate all the efforts there as well. Commissioners. Um, I think um, as we're wrestling how to work in a world where, where we have less uh, water and we need to be more conscious about uh, energy efficiency uh, and solar energy. I saw a, a design recently um, that takes six city lots and you could build about 58 units on that six lot. But, and it's all single family housing that will also have streets going up and it's kind of stacked as a unique and that the uh, solar panels can be adjusted so you have natural lighting that will uh, provide lighting to uh, urban farms along the way and also for uh, charging ports for their car. Um, as I was listening to the presentation, I was putting on my commissioner hat and said, <laughs> what is there uh, to allow us to do that uh, in Santa Ana? Is it possible? And what about this? What about seismic? What about... Uh, all these kinds of things. So um, I'm just thinking that uh, as we look at um, being a built up city, um, uh, you know, we are squeezing in more housing. It does have um, uh, detrimental effect upon the neighborhood in terms of parking, a lot of other things. We have not, as, as people, changed our habits uh, in terms of embracing uh, public transportation and and driving smaller cars and, and those kinds of things. And without those kind of choices, we're still feeding into the kind of housing um, that required uh, um, uh, the kind of things that we may not be meeting in the future. So uh, there's nothing to do today, but it's just to keep an eye on these things and ask ourselves, uh, what do we need in the way of guidance or, or will it be done for us uh, at the state level as they adopt more, uh, uh, you know, solar energy and energy efficient kind of thing that will come down to us and, and how do we need to fit that into a built up city? Uh, so um, that's just something that uh, keeps me up at night. <laughs> We're not probably keep you up weeks in, in terms of thinking what's coming down the pipe. But I'm hoping also as we go to the uh, planning conference that we'll learn a lot more about what's going on. Thank you, Commissioner Wu. And I, please, this, I'd just like to address that. I, you're welcome to speak, but it's at the time that's designated for, for the public uh, to speak. Um, if there's anything that you would like to speak on the matter, I, I would encourage you to reach out to staff or come back at the next meeting uh, during the public comment section. But at, at this time, we're going to finish up our proceeding, and uh, that's that's how okay. the meeting uh, will conclude. Just want to address that. Anything that there's no there is no additional comments from the commissioner or or um, staff. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. So next regular meeting will be held on Monday, October 10th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. in the council chambers. Thank you for coming. <laughs>